decades of progress towards the eradication of extreme poverty and the sustainable development fate of an entire generation of children and young people hangs in the balance. That's why today it's so important that we come together to discuss the crisis facing the most marginalised communities and to outline what a fair share for everyone could mean and how we... I'm delighted today to be joined by five panellists who are extremely well positioned to discuss this question today. They've all been working at the forefront of the struggle for justice for the most marginalised. I will briefly introduce them now for allowing them to introduce themselves properly as we address the questions for this session. Um, and before we do, I'm just going to allow Shahrazad in so that we should have the full range of panellists. So welcome Shahrazad. Um, so just a brief introduction for everyone. Joining us, we have um, Lihandro Piri, a youth activist from Malawi who works as a researcher for Restless Development Uganda. She is also a former NOREC ambassador and has been conducting her work in Kenya since January of this year till October. Welcome, Leandra. We also have Esther Ndeme Asiene. She is the founder of SOS Educacion Promot, an NGO promoting youth education on issues including health, democracy, and environmentalism in Cameroon. Welcome, Esther. Yeah, we also have Tego. The, fa the founder and executive director of Girls Vision Foundation, an NGO which seeks to advocate for the right of marginalized girls and women by empowering them through vocational and technical education across Ghana. Thank you, Abigail. We also have um, Ronja Hesse. She is the former president of the oh, National okay. Students' Union in Germany and is now the executive committee elect at the European Students' Union. And lastly, we have Shahrazad Abwalela, a colleague of mine, Shahrazad works as the Director of Policy and Communications at 100 Million Campaign, which is a global youth-led campaign fighting for all children to be free, safe, safe and educated. Thank you very much to all of you for joining us. Um, and just to briefly introduce myself, which I forgot to do, uh, my name's Sean. I'm the Community Groups Organiser, so I work with our network of youth activists around the world to be driving activism down at the grassroots community level. And it's an absolute pleasure to be l'éducation en Afrique depuis la pandémie. Et lorsqu'on parle de pandémie, si nous parlons de la COVID-19, la COVID-19 autant pour moi. Donc, je tiens à souligner que les, les États africains ne s'attendaient pas à, à recevoir une telle pandémie et surtout, personne n'avait prévu cette ampleur, l'ampleur que la pandémie a eue. Néanmoins, il y a des, des... Comment je vais appeler ça? Néanmoins, les, les États africains se sont battus autant que possible pour pouvoir résoudre ce problème euh, de la COVID. Donc, euh, on s'est rendu compte dans un État, par exemple, comme le Cameroun, où il y a eu un taux de um, can I check if other people on the English channel, uh, no, so it looks like people on the English channel are having difficulties uh, hearing this, hearing the interpretation. Um, I can see that the interpreter has just rejoined. If we can get it working, then we can proceed, but if not, perhaps we might need to move on to uh, our next panellist and revisit uh, Esther's contribution when that's up and running. Um, uh, the, to the French interpreter, are you now able to access the audio? And are we, have, are we okay to proceed with Esther's response? Um, Is it okay. okay, well, I think perhaps we, we ought to move on. Um, if you could let me know in the chat box when uh, the uh, functionality is, is up and running, we can get started again with Esther's answer. But apologies for that. We will move on for now. 
um, and just keep you posted on the. Okay, post so there, is an issue. there is an issue with uh, in uh, the network. That's what the interpreter said. Right. That is yeah. Well, if it's okay with you, perhaps we, we can move on whilst the interpreter tries to re-establish the internet connection and then we'll re revisit your answer shortly, if that's okay, Esther. Okay, cool. cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so, Ronya, if I can um, turn to you and ask the next question. Um, in your work, you will have experienced firsthand the benefits of collaboration between student and youth leaders in Europe. How do you think Europeans and Africans can work together in solidarity to uphold the rights of the most vulnerable and marginalised children and, 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 sorry, children and young people during and beyond the pandemic? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this question and also thank you the, for the invitation. I'm very, very pleased to be here today. Um, and well, as Sean has said, I come from a higher education politics background in Europe, mostly in Germany, actually. Um, and before I would start answering that question or my thoughts or giving my thoughts on that question, I'd like to highlight where I come from politically, because I think it's important to understand what I'm trying to say, um, because I've been mostly working in representative organizations on different levels. Um, and I think that's a very specific like form of making politics. It's very important, but also very specific. Um, but um, nevertheless, it's what I like to focus on because it's what I know. Um, and um, highlighting its importance, I think what I've learned in like such meta organizations and umbrella organizations like for example the All African Students Union is one or the European Students Union is one is that it's extremely important to organize in such a manner. And this is what I'd like to start with um, to elaborate and why I think that is the case. Um, because there are concerns and goals that we share and, um, and those concerns and goals are most likely to stay unheard if we don't organize and connect to add more strength and power to the demands that we have. Um, and this works through or organizing properly and is of major importance. But off, to put it that way, uh, on a local level, but nothing will ever change. Um, uh, another aspect is exchange is always beneficial. We don't have to reinvent the wheel over and over again. Um, and it's important to learn from each other. It saves resources and it improves the results. And now, and mostly leading to what's actually the core of the question, is um, <clears throat> having the chance to support one another through such meta organizations um, and enriching each other and fight a collective fight for a more equal and just society is especially important for those less privileged overarching structures and work networks that are aware of the fact that some organizations are less capable than others to reach out to policymakers or even articulate their needs helps the less privileged um, and, and make their concerns heard. Because every organization that is functioning in a supportive way can, do, um, can provide resources and a network and a platform for those less, uh, less privileged and the most marginalized voices. This is why every organization that bundles opinions and that is aware of what I said above has the potential of standing in solidarity with those furthest behind. And this, this form of meta organization is necessary because we still live in a world where people's available capital, um, a social position, sex, skin color, and many other things matter greatly when it comes to political influence. There's no place in the world I know of that this wouldn't be the case in. And also the pandemic hasn't changed too fast. No, oh, sorry. Uh, and also the pandemic hasn't changed a lot on that. Um, the pandemic has changed a lot with people's lives. It is a threat to people's health uh, and it also is a big threat to their subsistence. Um, the material basis of many people have been ripped away. This hits uh, the most marginalized groups the hardest, women, older people, people without a steady income or in precarious work conditions. And its negative effects have expand, uh, exponentialized in countries where there's no functioning welfare system. However, the most general imbalances have not been changed. They have only been exponentialized and reproduced. And so consequently, this only urges us to organize accordingly. And now I'd like to dedicate the rest of the time <laughs> to speak about 
um, how we can stand in solidarity together with people, young people, especially in Europe and in Africa. And again, I like to highlight that I'm coming from a very specific um, political area, which is representative politics. Um, and um, yeah, uh, there, there is a lot of small scale exchange that is very valuable, but it's just not, um, yeah, my, 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 my area, <laughs> sorry. Um, but for every aspect of solidarity and of common organization that I've already mentioned above, and I would usually never use that slogan, it is the bigger the better. If we take our solidarity to the bigger scale, we can also reach more. If we move closer together, this can also mean that the demands that benefit the most vulnerable can be made heard. Um, and this, what I've tried to elaborate on is not only potentially um, beneficial for marginalized and vulnerable people, um, for my regard is also an obligation. And I mean this not only ethically, but also through historical responsibility. Because we all know that in many regards, the devastating situations that many people are living in are the results of centuries of colonization. Those cannot be undone, but also they have not been worked through adequately and the necessary consequences have not been taken in many regards. Exploitation is still ongoing and often leads to Western governments and companies. And Sean has mentioned in his introduction that actually the policies that are integrated and implemented at the moment do not fight against it, but rather reproduce the material differences that we like are facing in our societies. Um, and those historical material differences matter. The realities of people um, have to be addressed when working together. And I think it's very important, especially for the European people, to bear that in mind when working together and when trying to move closer together, no matter. Um, in order not to reproduce the power structures and the power differences and not to contribute to new colonial patterns. Europeans have to be aware of the history and the damage that has been done to different extents and is still done in many regards. This has to be part of our solidarity and this has to be like bear in mind when we try to create like a, a bigger scale network to support one another and especially support those furthest behind. And I'm almost done. I just like to mention a couple of practical things that we can um, try to um, or are already trying to implement. This is, for example, um, shared support of important campaigns like the 100 million campaign, but also supporting grassroots activities um, on a bigger political level. But also, and um, more importantly, and that's what we need meter organizations for, providing a political platform. There are political demands that have to be met here. One of my go-to topics is um, exchange, like capacity building, political debate and empowerment should not know borders. But this is not the case at the moment. Um, and I think this is what, what's worth fighting for and organizing for is that we can share all the knowledge and the experience that we have with one another because it makes sense and it saves resources and it will help us to like reach um, the goals that we have that have been actually articulated. Those furthest behind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ronya. It was uh, <laughs> that was that was great to hear about the, you know, your belief in the importance of of uh, representative organisations and and collaboration between those. Um, to uh, you, you know, highlight the sort of historical and moral responsibility that you believe, you know, Europeans um, bear in this kind of in this. Uh, in this effort and to hear those practical steps is really I think really really important around you know supporting grassroots efforts um, providing political platforms in Europe um, and uh, the elimination of borders when it comes to uh, this collaboration um, so thank you so much Ronya um, I'm sure we'll be uh, coming back to you to hear more of your perspective later um, but uh, for now um, Esther I I appreciate is not uh, the easiest thing to do when it's not your first language. Um, if you're happy to do that, uh, I can present that question to you again. Is that is yeah. that sound okay? Yeah, sure. Okay, okay great. Um, so my question was: um, Millions of children have lost months of education this year, and existing education inequality has worsened. 
What is your assessment of the state of education in Africa since the onset of the pandemic? And what do you think needs to be done to address this education crisis? Okay, thank you very much, Sean. Okay, thank you very much uh, for... I'll try my best and um, you guys will just support me like that, um, please. Sorry, Esther, Don't just to interrupt. Uh, yeah. I've just realized you might be on a different ch interpretation channel. Um, but uh, I'm not able to hear your speaking. Are other people able to hear Esther? No. Um, Esther, are you, are you currently on one of the interpretation channels? No, I didn't change anything. Okay, apologies. We can hear you fine now. I think there was just a temporary audio issue. Okay, cool. Okay. So I was saying, please excuse me if my English is not perfect. And uh, I will do a lot of mistakes, but please, I'm sorry already. Okay, so, you know, the African governments were not ready to face the... <laughs> We're not ready to face the COVID-19, but despite that far, everyone switch to the French channel. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. If everyone can yeah. switch to the French channel, I think we should be able to hear Esther clearly. Apologies for this, Esther, and um, please do not apologize for your uh, English skills because I can't speak any French, and I think um, you've already done a fantastic job. So very much looking forward to hearing you speak. Okay, so, okay, I was saying like uh, no African country was, pre was prepared to face a coronavirus issue. So because of the corona uh, in the world, like, uh, like France and Forsyth, um, uh, more than 1 billion students were out of school, like not less than for three months. And for example, the case of Cameroon, 7.2 million of uh, uh, students were out of school. And many of them even almost dropped out because they spent like six months without going to school. And uh, it became very difficult because a lot of them forgot even how to do the little things they used to do in school and it became really hard and uh, we could uh, realize that even 47 percent of girls dropped out of school during that period in central africa and yet many uh, two countries i know mauritius island and uh, and gabon have not uh, have not resumed school year because of the coronavirus uh, talk. So the the consequences are very difficult, are very uh, huge on those students because many of them, as they spend a lot of time without going to school and they were used to the traditional uh, school, that means you go every day, you sit on the bench and the professor or the teacher is in front of you speaking, it became very difficult for them to say, okay, we're going to learn now e-learning, we're going to start by e-learning, or we're going to go to the TV and see how a teacher is telling us to do this or that. It was very difficult, and many could not cope. And the other problem was the fact that the parents themselves could not follow out their children because they go to work in the morning, and they'll come back and they, 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 were not, they were no more used to that role, to that to playing that role. Like sorry, staying sorry at Esther, home. just to interrupt. I think we've had another issue. Um, the channel seems to have... Uh, could, you, could you try speaking again? Working. Hello. Is it okay now? I think it's... Another interpreter speaking. Okay. Apparently, we need to go back to the English channel now. Um, so, Esther, if you're able to go back to the English channel as well. Apologies for this. Yeah, no problem. Is it okay now? Are you getting me now? But Esther, have you managed to switch to the English channel? Yeah. I mean, the English channel has not changed. Is it okay now? Um, 
I think so. It's a, it's a little quiet, but maybe if you get started, I can let you know if it's going okay. Is it okay? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little quiet. Are you on the English channel? Yeah. Is it okay now? Are you getting me? Are you getting me now? Yeah, I'm on the English China channel. That's great. We can hear you. We can hear you fine now. So if you're happy to continue where you left off. Okay. Okay, cool. So uh, I was saying there are two countries yet who have not resumed school, Mauritius and Gabon, because of the coronavirus. And they have not, they don't know how to, to cope with uh, uh, with, uh, uh, by limiting the contamination. And we realize yeah. to that it's very difficult for people, for the uh, poor class, for the social class of people who are poor. It's difficult for them because the government decided to limit the number of students in classes. And And they try to the part time, like two times, twice a day. There is uh, these people. There is a belief at twelve. There is another group who will go at twelve thirty, and uh, to leave around three p.m. because they thought that was the best way. The number of people in the class maybe should be like thirty people, not beyond thirty people. And because of that, the quality of students who used to go to school every morning. What is so huge that the government can no more control in the Cameroonian government, they can no more control that um, the number of students. So the only thing they have to do is to build new schools. And uh, parents who are poor cannot afford private education and their children are obliged to stay at home. And that's very difficult. And we can have the illegal accessibility to technology, to internet. And that's something very important. That's an important fact that, that has to be solved in the whole Africa. Because uh, we realize that it's only in the main cities that people, people have internet using and people use uh, Android phones. But our smartphone, that would, when you go to the villages or the local areas, it becomes very difficult for everybody to have access to those, uh, to those uh, materials. So it's very important. And because of that now, many people will be out uh, of even learning, e-learning, things like that. And uh, there are a lot of schools, like I said, we closed. And here, for example, in the place of Cameroon, limited, the government limited the hour of school. Now people have four hours of school. Imagine someone who spent six months without going to school and who will spend now, who will be going to school at new and will spend all discussions with lecturers. Because in my NGO, we go to those schools to the lecture in order for them uh, in, uh, to give uh, some uh, courses because the lecturers too uh, there is a problem of the the numbers of lecturers so we realized when we used to when we go down in schools uh, lecturers are complaining that four hours for a child who spent uh, like six months without going to school is so low to implement and to give him more new knowledge because even the one they had before so they have to start so now as that we have to to see to rework the quality let's move from the uh, how can I say it let's move from the from the traditional lecture the traditional class to in classes because the world is a is on a perpetual evolution so it's very important for, for, for the government to to work to follow the evolution of the world so they have to encourage to learn uh, difficult because in africa the thing like if you have a degree e degree 
is just a learning course. That means you have uh, less knowledge than the person who follows the traditional school, the classic school, who goes to school and meets and talk face to face with the person. And that's very hard. That's what many people have the who brought back their e their e their degree online were not uh, admitted in other schools or even a. Uh, in uh, some workplace, so their degree was not recognized. But I think it's high time those type of degrees being recognized and being taken uh, very serious. So the other thing is to encourage, as I was talking about e-learning, and uh, a part of e-learning, even to educate from a nursery school, like it's important, like they can watch TV and the professor is talking to them. I think the initiation should start right now in the nursery school. And uh, because people at a certain age, as they were not used to, it's not easy, but maybe with them, they will be talking. And uh, we need uh, the government, the African government needs, needs to give free access education to everybody not only access education in the quality of the lecturers because even the lecturers have to be uh, re retrained they have to be on the e-learning on the e-lecturing because they are used to only uh, they are used to their <laughs> they are used to the traditional learning uh, they are used to the traditional uh, lecturing, but I think it's high time for train into the modern. Allow me to say that to the modern lecturing, and uh, apart. I know it's difficult to say. Oh, let's bring internet into villages. It's very difficult now, but progressively we have to start implementing that. And a part of implementing, I think people in the city now can start using the e-learning form. Yes, sir, I'm sorry to I'm sorry to interrupt. But if you could, uh, we're just we're running short on time because of the delays. Your remarks to a close. Yeah, I'm almost done. <laughs> okay, great. Just so we can allow everyone to speak, if you could just, yeah, if you could wrap up and then um, we'll move on. But yeah, please do finish. Okay, cool. So, uh, the, I said the lecturers can go to the village and face and train people, even at home, doing, uh, how can I say, the blocks in quarters. They can do blocks of, uh, of schools. And uh, in the cities, people can be used. And she might be having internet issues. Um, you're also on mute, Abigail, if you can hear us. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to jump on to the next person, if that's okay, and we can hopefully come back to Abigail. Um, so my next question is for Leandra. Um, so Leandro, it's, it's one thing for us to be on this call today talking amongst ourselves about the injustices facing children and young people, but how can we turn this into action and how can we on their responsibilities to delivering a fair share? Leandro, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sean. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, I have a flu. To address the question, um, I have indeed the bearers are not held to account for the responsibilities to delivering a fair share to young people and the youth. And I'll share, um, I'll speak on two perspectives. Um, the first one is, I'll, I'll look at it uh, from the social point of view. I think we can help build individual accountability. We can wake the people 
and the youths through trainings on social accountability. I believe that at the outset of any initiative or activity, it is very crucial for individuals to, under to understand expectations, the resources, and the support available for them. So in this way, if young people and youths are trained, it can ease the process and it can actually strengthen gold standard accountability. Kofi Annan once said, knowledge is power, information is liberating, education is um, the promise of progress in every society and in every family. So I think that it can be very crucial to share information with youths faced on what they need to know and what they should hold these account uh, on what they should hold these leaders accountable to and um on the second perspective i'll speak from um communications perspective i'm a communication specialist so i can look at it this way um I think we can take up space in the media. Actually, we can make use of traditional media, such as the radio, newspapers, and the new media as well, and thus the internet through uh, many different uh, social websites. So we can actually use the media to prioritize the voices and experiences of young people and the youths to ensure that they are not overlooked. The whole idea is bringing on board true stories shared by young people to expose those political leaders that they are not up to their call of work, if that is the case. And we can draft documents such as memos, letters, to um, devote all that rights to can be presented to responsible bodies. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Deandra. Um, I, I especially appreciate uh, how concisely you, you were able to uh, communicate those points. Um, but if I could summarize, um, you, uh, you, you rightly raised the, the, the kind of need to support young people in their efforts uh, to hold leaders to account. And you've, you've, you talked about your first-hand experience of training on youth governance. And I think I agree that that's something we should definitely be thinking about how we can replicate that. Um, and uh, I think it's important to, to, to put that responsibility on, on, uh, on adults and, and other, like other youth leaders to train other young people so that you know, we can stand in solidarity and support one another. Um, and you offered some really helpful practical suggestions on how to do this. So using uh, sort of traditional media, but also new media online on the internet, social media, uh, to prioritize and amplify the voices of young people. Um, and I think there were some internet connections towards the end, so I hope I understood correctly, but um, I think you were talking about uh, drafting letters and sort of issues. held to account. Um, mm -hmm. I hope I captured that uh, accurately what you said um, but thank you so much I really appreciate how sort of action focused that was um, really really inspiring. Um, moving on because I'm aware that uh, um, Abigail it seems like you've been able to rejoin us. Um, if you are with us I might, uh, can you hear me Abigail? Um, Are you are you with us? I can see that audio is coming from your account, but I'm not able to actually hear. Um, I don't know if you're on. Are you on uh, the English language channel, Abigail? Um, if anyone else can hear Abigail uh, on any of the different channels, you let me know. Um, otherwise, um, perhaps one of the organizers of this Zoom meeting could just check in with Abigail to see if she's having any technical issues. And in the meantime, um, I might move on to um, 
Shahrazad, and uh, ask my question to her if that's okay. Um, Shahrazad, you've worked extensively on formulating influential reports on the need for a fair share for children. Could you yes, please... I'm here. Oh, great. Sorry, was that Abigail speaking? Uh, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very sorry, yeah. Abigail. It looks like we're having we're having issues yeah. receiving your audio. Um, are you? I assume you have your camera switched off. To help with the connection. Um, Abigail, if you can hear me, I'm, I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to give you a bit more time to establish a stronger connection and I'm going to um, just move on contribution and then hopefully we go. Okay. okay, sorry about that and hopefully we'll be with you soon. Um, so just to finish my question, I was just asking if, um, Shahrazad, you can paint a picture of the crisis affecting children and young people today. And briefly, could you outline the key policies that you believe are necessary to prevent this child rights crisis from worsening? Yes, that's really bad. Thank you, Abigail. If, we'll just hear from Shahrazad now, and then um, once we well, have that contribution, we'll, we'll hand the floor to you. My camera is on. I think there's a there's a yes, significant it's... delay in um, the and you. I'm going to place you on mute. Apologies, and I'm just going to hand the floor to Shahrazad so we can hear her contribution. I'm here. Hello. Should I start? Yes, if that's okay. Um, and then we'll move on to. Okay. Thank you, Sean. So the simple answer to your question is it's the world's poorest children who are suffering and the solution is really for the world's richest governments to stop throwing money at tax dodging, business, tax dodging businesses and allocate a fair share of funding to the people who need it the most. But we're here today discussing this because we know that mostly this has not happened. Since the start of the pandemic, youth activists and campaigners all over the world have repeatedly warned governments about the devastating impact that COVID-19 will have on the rate of progress across all children's rights, especially for the 20% of children who are living on $2 a day or less. Reports from the ground so far demonstrate that the predictions were correct. As well as what we've heard from colleagues on the call today, we know from youth activists in Peru that children are dropping out of school and entering extremely dangerous forms of child labour, like, like mining, just to keep food on the table. We know from youth activists in Malawi that teenage pregnancies and child marriages are skyrocketing in some regions. I can tell you today that I worked in a refugee camp in Greece, in Europe, and saw with my own eyes that even very young children are undertaking child labour as a way to increase their food rations. And it's also just for something to do because right now there is no education available to them. In fact, we know from activists all over the world that children are not afraid of COVID. They're afraid of dying of hunger because of the pandemic. As I said earlier, before the pandemic, almost 20% of the world's children were living on $2 a day or less. We do not know how many more children are now living in extreme poverty. But Save the Children recently produced a survey of over 30,000 households, the most comprehensive survey during the pandemic, and this analysed the crisis affecting children predominantly in lower income countries. But for households, they serve 25% and 100% of their income. The world's richest countries have spent $8 trillion on COVID relief so far, but they have entirely in need. The new normal is not social distancing, it's not mask wearing and it's not lockdown. The new normal is living with the consequences of an unjust response by rich countries to a global crisis which has caused a reversal in 20 years of progress on children's right to childhood. There are solutions to this but they are reliant on money and political will. Today, there remain significantly underfunded COVID appeals for relief in humanitarian emergencies and in the world's poorest countries. 
The amount needed to fully fund these is a fraction of the eight trillion that's been spent in rich countries so far. It is immoral that this has not already been done. From the survey, 75% of the households which lost all of their income have so far received no government support, absolutely nothing. There is an urgent need for social protection to be implemented, including benefits which are designed to specifically protect children from the worst impacts of the pandemic. Public needs to be significantly improved in lower income countries. Otherwise, there will never be a sustainable way for any country to ensure every citizen can enjoy their rights. All of this can be paid for by a combination of debt cancellation, fairer taxation and increased aid allocations, particularly to education and social protection. I want to be clear that these policies, the reports we've written and the campaign work we have done have all been led by young people. We are now seeing some movement on a global social protection fund, and it is important to note that young people were among the first to call for this during the pandemic. Personally, it has been a real honour to fight for the rights of the most marginalised alongside the powerful youth activists here today. But let's not forget that the fight continues. I hope that we will continue to stand in solidarity with the children and young people bearing the brunt of this crisis, and thank you to Azu for the invitation to speak here today. Thank you. Shahrazad, that was a bleak picture that you've painted of uh, the situation facing children and young people, but a really important one for us all to, to hear. From the kind of, from the issues of child labour, hunger, lack of education, these are, these are devastating consequences. And uh, the solutions that you've offered uh, include, you know, uh, funding, uh, underfunded global COVID responses, uh, investment in social protections, uh, increasing spending on public services, and funding all of that through a combination of uh, robust taxation mechanisms um, and increased aid spending. Um, and I really appreciated your final point around leadership that we've already seen and hopefully will continue to see into next year. Um, Abigail, it looks like you've been able to rejoin us. Um, I'm hoping we can have your your contribution um, as we draw to an end of this uh, draw to the end of this panel discussion. Are you able to hear me? Okay. If you can, can I suggest that you turn your camera off because I think that might free up your connection bandwidth. So we'll just we'll give. Um, a minute or so so we can try and get this sorted because we really want to hear Abigail's contribution um, and it's I feel very frustrated for you that it's that we've not been able to to get this sorted um, I'm just going to type in the chat Abigail you can't hear me Uh, Abigail, you see here. Hello. Great, Abigail. Do you Abigail, want to? You see you. Great. Um, there might be a slight delay, but um, if you do want to, if you want to try answering the question that I um, initially asked, we'd love to hear your your contribution. Hello. Yeah. I, I'm going to read out the question, and I think if there's a delay, perhaps maybe you know when you eventually hear it you can start speaking and perhaps we might just hear you but on a bit of a delay. So let's just try this. I'm going to read out the question. And the question is, we know that as well as children and young people, women are also being hardest hit by the effects of the pandemic. What can governments be doing to minimise the worst impacts on women and prevent existing gender inequalities from worsening? We'll just wait because there might be a slight delay. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And Abigail, sorry if I'm interrupting, okay. but if you could turn your camera off, I think that might help.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. I just the next one. Is it off? Hello. Is my camera off? Um it's on here. Your camera is still showing on Zoom. I think we, so we have gone over our time limit. So I, I'm really, really keen to hear your contribution, Abigail. Um, but can she, can she speak in audio? Can she cut her camera and do the audio call? At times it helps. Yeah. If you can switch your camera off, Abigail, uh, we can still see your camera. If you can switch can you your camera off. I can, I can. Uh, it's, fantastic audio quality I can hear some of what you're saying but if you could switch your camera off I think that okay. will help in the midst of COVID-19 in the midst of COVID-19 all children of all ages So I, your camera has now been switched off, Abigail. I'm, af I'm afraid we haven't got much time left. So um, perhaps we can try one last time, if you're able to hear me now, um, with answering your question. Um, you're on mute currently, Abigail. I think... Sadly, we might need to, um, it seems like we're not going to be able to hear from Abigail. Um, but perhaps, perhaps um, Abigail, you can share a, a text version of your contribution and perhaps that can be circulated uh, by the organisers. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that will be possible um, because it's to hear, hear your contribution. Can you hear me now? Um, I can hear you now, but I'm not sure if there's a delay. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me now? It's going to work, unfortunately. Um, I, I can hear you, but I think that there seems to be too much of a delay. Okay. Hello? I'm... Um, I'm very sorry. Um, can you hear me now? <laughs> we can. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. 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 So I should send a chip this message. Okay, I'm very sorry, everyone. I think we're going to have to. Um, I think we'll have to call it. Uh, we have to draw the draw this panel discussion to an end. Um, it's a great shame that we weren't able to hear from Abigail, but um, th these are the challenges uh, of uh, working internationally and actually, you know, having just spoken about the the digital divide and how you know people without strong internet access can be excluded from the, these important um, these you know these important events. We've, we've seen it in action and, and kind of highlights the importance of bridging that gap. Um, but if I can try to sort of to, to summarize this panel discussion and, and kind of, um, and all the, the fantastic contributions that were made, um, I will, so just to look back on sort of on Ronya's con contribution around, you know, solidarity between Europe and Africa, um, some fantastic uh, contributions around, you know, representative organisations and the um, the moral and historical responsibility upon Europeans to be uh, to be sort of leading that effort and and sort of establishing those connections. Um, I think there's some really uh, strong links with what you were saying, Ronya, and what Shahrazad was saying around 
um, the you know <laughs> I think quite quite effectively of you know it's tax judging businesses and uh, and these irresponsible rich governments that are failing and I think that there's, there's a clear role for Europeans and Africans to be working in solidarity on that. Um, so that was uh, that was really great to hear. And then we heard from Esther, um, who gave, painted a really uh, a clear picture of the the education crisis that's happening right now in Africa as a result of COVID. Um, we heard about how um, girls have been marginalised and people from uh, poorer so socioeconomic sorry poorer socioeconomic backgrounds um, and the widening digital digital divide. Um, I think it, you know we heard about how it's the responsibility of governments to be stepping up and um, and sort of minimising that divide and making interventions to stop people from falling further and further back. Um, so uh, thank you for those contributions. Um, Leandra gave a really powerful uh, contribution around uh, how young people can be holding leaders to account, speaking firsthand on her experience of youth governance. And, uh, and how actually we, we all bear a responsibility to be sharing those knowledge, that, those skills and that knowledge and how to do that and be using our platforms to amplify young voices and reminding leaders that actually young people will be holding them to account. Um, that also ties in nicely with what Shahrazad was saying about, you know, in terms of the, the, the policies that we need, it's actually, it needs to be young leaders who are, who are driving those demands and, and uh, holding uh, decision makers uh, feet to the fire or holding them to account. Um, so uh, that was a bit of a garbled summary, but I hope I captured what everyone has been saying. Um, it's uh, the, the, the discussion that we're having today, as we said before, th this is all, you know, this all aligns so closely with what we work on at 100 million. Um, our mission is to create a world where every child is free, safe and educated. And uh, COVID-19 threatens to undo all of that hard work that, that people have been working on for decades. So I hope, um, you know, in joining this uh, panel discussion, you felt inspired by hearing some of the, the problems, but also some of the solutions. I hope you felt inspired to be... Um, we have our, we, we've had our Global Justice for Every Child campaign, which has been in response to COVID-19. And um, ASU has been instrumental in, uh, in creating this campaign and driving it in Africa. So I encourage everyone on the call to be, uh, to sort of have a look at Justice for Every Child. You can go on 100million.org forward slash JFEC, Justice for Every Child. And I really encourage you to join the campaign and get in touch with us to, to, uh, to hear more about how you can be driving it in your country and at your community. Um, but for now, just a huge, huge thank you to all of the panelists and for your for your uh, for your contributions, um, and, I, and thank you everyone to join for joining as well. Um, I hope you've left feeling inspired. Um, apologies for the technical issues, um, but uh, we managed to get there in the end. And again, apologies for speaking too fast. I know I'm doing it right now, but I, I will solve that by just uh, drawing to a close. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.